that we have Sprint One demos this week. So you've had a project manager from another team contact you. Hopefully you've scheduled the interview. You've scheduled the demo uh, by now. Uh, be ready for that. It's happening. This is the week. Uh, Sprint One due. So if you haven't finished all your code, your tasks and everything, make sure you're in that mad scramble to, to finish that up as students always do. Uh, but what I want to highlight here is the peer and self-evaluation form. Uh, make sure you're filling this out by uh, by Friday. Oh, piss off. Never mind. Duo. Anyway, it looks like a Google form. Um, didn't get an, if you didn't get an email for the demo, shoot me an email, I guess, or Dr. Hertz or both, and we'll look into it. We'll make sure. Uh, we'll see what's going on with that. Um, so fill out the self and peer eval. Make sure you do this by Friday night and uh, and submit the your assessment of yourself and your teammates. That follows this rubric from up here, the evaluation of teamwork. So study this rubric or at least pull it up. I have it linked from the form too, so you can't miss it. Um, look through this rubric and you're going to be asked to rate each of your teammates and yourself on each of these five categories on this zero to three scale. So if you're not sure if this is a one or a two, refer to the rubric and decide what that teammate, uh, where that teammate lies. Uh, I recommend not just uh, what students tend to do is give their selves and all their teammates threes. I mean, if everybody actually was exemplary, fine. Um, but don't complain when your teammate actually slacked off, but you didn't tell me at all. Uh, that's my way of knowing if a teammate was slacking off. If somebody wasn't pulling their weight, let me know and let me fix that in the grading. Let me give you the grade you deserve and them the grade they deserve. I can't do that if you don't let me know that there was a problem. Uh, and I will say the peer and self-evaluation will not directly affect your grade. I will take that information into consideration, process it all. Uh, in tricky cases, I'll even go into your repos, check all your commits and stuff, and determine how to distribute the points. It is a uh, uh, zero-sum game, is that the right phrase? Where if I, take, uh, if I lower one teammate's score... I'm going to raise somebody else's. So whatever your project grade is, whatever your team earned, the average grade of all the teammates is going to equal the project grade. So I'm never going to tank an entire team if everybody says, yeah, we're terrible, we're a terrible team. I'm not just going to tank the whole team. Somebody has to has to be the one who earned that grade, and somebody has to be the one who did not earn that grade, that project grade. I'll distribute points accordingly. Uh, zero sum is the... okay. Yeah, that's the good, that's the phrase. So it is a zero-sum game. So don't be worried that, oh, if I say all of my team sucked, he's going to lower our project grade. No, this is just how I do the individual grading. There's always problems if we don't do something like peer evals. Uh, there's always the issue of teams come to me late in the semester and say, well, most of a team comes to me late in the semester and says, hey, we have this one teammate who hasn't done anything. Or even worse, one student comes to me and says the rest of their team did nothing all semester. And uh, this is my way of correcting those situations. You don't have to come and complain to me. Just fill out your peer and self evals. I'll take care of it from there. You don't have to worry about uh, about the fairness of the course in terms of uh, participation across your teammates. So let me know how everybody did. If you did have teammates that um, that didn't do much, let me know, and then I can make the decisions after that. Uh, and I'll usually look at the repos to verify and make sure that somebody's not just ranting. Uh, on the other side of that, if you do notice that your grade is lower than one of your teammates, that does not necessarily mean that somebody tanked you on the peer evals. I want to make that clear. There are cases where everybody says, you know, the whole team did great. Everybody was fantastic, exemplary all around. Uh, and I'll go in the repo and notice that one teammate did absolutely nothing. All sprint. Uh, I, I might just go in there and change the grades as necessary um, and ignore your peer and self evals. So just make that, I just want to make that clear. If your grade is less than one of your teammates, it doesn't mean, you know, don't be looking around for a teammate to yell at and to be mad at. It might've been me who you want to be mad at or rather yourself for not doing anything. So just make that clear. 
Uh, and also, on the other side of that, if you do tank a teammate and say, man, they did nothing, I might not necessarily lower their score, but I will look at that and consider the situation and what happened. Um, I do both of those things in either way to make sure to try to get you to put some honest feedback in that form uh, so I don't just see everybody was exemplary across the board. Uh, I don't think I downloaded the slides yet. So with that, anybody have quick questions about that? Oh, and usually just the way I roll, if you don't fill out the the uh, self or self and uh, teammate. Oh man, what do we call it? Whatever it was, the eval forms. If you don't fill it out at all, I usually weight that against you. Just a heads up. Especially when I have like two members of a team, only two members of a team filled it out, and they said the other three members did nothing, and the other three members didn't even bother filling out the peer eval form. It doesn't look good for you. It, it's not a good look. Just uh, just throwing that out there. So do what you're going to do, but just a heads up. I usually have my phone on silent, but I turned the volume on the other day. I still missed the call, but uh, I got to put that on silent again. Uh, I don't want to be interrupted again. Talk about coupling. Actually, I want to check if there's a question here. If someone didn't complete a user story for a sprint, does it affect the grade of everyone or just the person that didn't complete the user story? Uh, struggling through life, this is where the things start combining. So it'll affect the team. You'll get a lower sprint grade. And then you can fill out the peer evals to say, we got a lower sprint grade because it was that person's fault. And then I can go in and adjust the uh, individual grades to be able to uh, serve justice, So, as it were. But if somebody doesn't complete their user story, the um, you're being assessed as a team for the demo. The peer evals, that's the only way that I can actually correct those kinds of things. We don't want slackers getting grades that they haven't earned and just riding off the rest of the team. I do not like seeing that. I, it drives me insane. Uh, and it happens every semester in this course, so I've learned to be fairly brutal with the... Uh, with the redistribution of individual points. Yeah, and the people who exactly apple at them. This is always my issue. I don't. So when I give these talks, I try to f uh, focus it more towards good students because they're the only ones listening when I say these things. Uh, so if your teammate is tanking on you, if they're ghosting you, make sure you let me know so I can, you know, I can do something about that. I have the same problem in 116. We just had the first homework deadline and like half the class did terrible. But I can't like give a rant and lecture about it because those students aren't there. What do I do? <laughs> it's hard to contact students who are just completely ghosting. I'm sure some of you feel that way with your teammates, with your team members. There's already one student who's just ghosted their team all semester so far. Uh, we're supposed to complete user stories five. Um, it's up to what your PM said. So yeah, if your PM just said complete the task, each PM has flexibility in the way they manage the projects. Uh, but for your demo, you are demoing to a different PM, and they do want to see actual features, completed features. Maybe they'll be a little lenient for sprint one, just because you know it's sprint one. Um, but you should have something to show them still. So if all you have is a bunch of completed tasks and nobody finished a complete story, what are you going to demo this week is the big question. So that might affect your grade. And in Syncoriz, part of that's up to your PM. Your PM should be managing your tasks in a way that ha gets you to something to demo for Sprint 1. So it's possible your PM gave you a little too much freedom there, but you got to have something to demo. All right, I got to get through some slides. We got a lot of slides as usual. So uh, let's talk about coupling. So last time we talked about cohesion. Now we're going to talk about somewhat the other side of that in coupling. And we're going to see how these two are related. Uh, I already uh, remember this, so I don't need my reminder slide, but make sure you're doing the peer and selfie bills and scheduling the demo if you haven't already. 
So, I thought I deleted those slides. I'm going to skip them. I meant to delete those three. Uh, so, last time we talked about a module. This is something you've been hearing about ever since you started programming, I'm sure. Um, but a module being just some set of code that's uh, that's encapsulated or set aside in some way. Some languages, it, they're actually called modules. Some languages, they're called other things. And according to the definition, I would say multiple different things are modules. I would say each class is a module. I would say each package is also a module or directory if your language doesn't have packages. Any, at any level where code is grouped together in some way, I would refer to that as a module. And then we talked about uh, planning and defining these modules in a way that makes your code uh, easy to read and understand, easy to expand, and easy to test. These are three of the big things that we want out of our code, out of well-designed code. And uh, Abraham Lincoln, with a good quote here, do more... I'll paraphrase, of course. Doing more planning is always worth it. Do more planning if you have the time. Don't just dive right into a task. Last time we talked about cohesion, meaning the grouping of these modules makes sense. So here we have a tool that makes sense to have these tools all together. There are a lot of projects where you're going to want all these utilities, or at least most of them. There's not many projects where you're going to want all of this all together. This needs to be split into... Um, smaller packages or smaller modules with better cohesion. Uh, so with cohesion, the ultimate solution, which is terrible, is to just make each module one line. If it's just one line, there's perfect cohesion. That one line makes sense with itself. So, great, cohesion. Um, with, the, with cohesion, we want the grouping of code to make sense. Perfect. Uh, but this is obviously a terrible solution. And there is no real perfect cohesion. There's no perfect answer to this. This is one of the things that you just get better with with experience as you start learning how to organize your code base. You have a large project, you expect... Uh, tens of thousands of lines where how do you group the code you just get better with time it's a tough thing and it's just something senior devs are going to be better at than junior devs just because they've been doing it longer it's a very tough thing and it requires a lot of practice you got to be on a lot of projects and really you gotta um really you gotta uh Maybe this isn't the best advice, but you, you got to mess it up sometimes. I know I've learned a lot about cohesion um, and coupling just by getting deep into a code base and writing a large code base that was horribly designed by me. And, and then I said, oh, crap, that's why we learned about that. Maybe I should uh, listened and did that. Uh, so some of these things you will end up making by mistake, which is part of the, I said this before, but it's part of the nice nature of this course is I show you these tips and tricks and stuff in lecture, how to do well on your project. If you ignore the advice, you're still going to learn that advice because you're going to feel the pain. You're just going to learn it the hard way that, rather than the easy way, which of course I did uh, uh, many times. So we're all going to do it. Uh, but if you can limit the number of things you learn the hard way, you're going to be better off for it. So let's transition into coupling, kind of a, kind of another side of that. We have these modules. We have them making sense. We have that nice cohesion separated, making sense in the way they're separated and grouped. But now they're going to have to interact with each other. So if, if we had one big module, we wouldn't have to worry about coupling at all. We would have no coupling because there's no pieces, there's no modules to interact with each other. But coupling is the way those inter modules interact with each other. Uh, so we want very loose coupling is going to be the spoiler. That's the punchline here. Very loose coupling. So it's easier to reuse our code. It's going to be easier to test our code. It's going to be less prone to errors. There's just a lot, uh, a lot of goodness to come out of keeping our modules loosely coupled. You know, I was going to say something about this one, but, uh, um, I'm not going to, but very, very closely linked here by just by land, by borders, very highly coupled countries and very loosely coupled only, uh, 
connected through Central America. So it's kind of a visualization of what we're talking about. Uh, coupling is also not solvable. This is a, a very tricky thing that's just going to happen. Uh, that's just going to happen with experience. You're going to get better and better at loosely coupling your programs. Uh, but this is, uh, I, I'd argue a little bit about programmers' intelligence, maybe to an extent, but experience, certainly. As you get better and and uh, experience more code bases and create and design more code bases of your own, you'll get better at loosely coupling your modules. Um, you, you can't just solve this by throwing everything in one module. Yeah, there's no coupling to even be talked about or discussed, but uh, it's kind of the opposite of, your perfect cohesion this is going to have awful cohesion and nothing to talk about with coupling or you have every module is one line great you have perfect cohesion but horrible uh, horrible horrible coupling problem how do you couple all these one line modules so there's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle it's very elusive it's very hard to find but let's at least talk about what coupling is we're going to talk about this in five different levels, kind of like we did with cohesion, where we talked about different levels of cohesion. And there is uh, more of a scale to this one, where last time, some of them were debatable of once we got into the ones that didn't completely suck. It's debatable of what levels of cohesion are appropriate, and I'd say it depends on the project and the specific application. With this one, there is more of a progression. Each level of coupling does get better, in my opinion, I'll throw that out there. Um, but each one does come with some drawbacks where it, it makes it tougher to reach that next level. So we usually will, we might settle for a lower level of coupling or a, a tighter level of coupling just because we can't quite get to the next level without completely reorganizing our code or sacrificing some cohesion or, uh, or something else that we don't want. Maybe we sacrifice some testability. Well, it's debatable to higher, better coupling should be better testability, but... Uh, but we might lose somewhere else by getting to the higher ones. But we'll start with the ones that are terrible that you should never do, and then uh, start getting into the ones that have their place before we get to the really best ones. So let's start with content coupling. And I'll be honest, uh, I had to read this a few times to just understand what this even is because I can't, like, I can't comprehend why anybody would design like this. I'm like. There are not people who design so horribly that they would do this. This is obviously the worst level of coupling. It's where modules depend on the inner details of other modules. So this completely flies in the face of uh, encapsulation, where we want to hide the details and only expose a public interface. When you're writing a module at any level, I'll use a class for an example, you want to expose a certain number of public methods, and then users call those public methods, and then you have all these private methods and private variables that are going to control the inner details of what happens, of how that interface is enabled. But you just advertise the public interface. You, you have documentation to say how to call the public methods and what they do. And then all the inner details are hidden to people using your class. They don't need to know the details. Content coupling says, screw that. You have to know the inner details to get this thing to work. And actually rely on those inner details and i can't i still am having trouble like coming up with examples of why or what besides the one that dr hertz put here um uh, is a good example of on a gui at least where you have all your uh, gui elements their locations just rely on each other so you throw all your guis that elements there and if you make one smaller for example all the ones below it go move up the screen that's um those are elements that are depending on the details of other elements and not the functionality of other elements. Uh, aside from that, aside from the GUI example, I'm having trouble like, like why I, I can't, no, just don't, don't do that. If you find a way to do this, just don't, don't do it. Uh, this obviously makes your code impossible to, to really maintain or, or work with. Uh, don't, don't do it. Uh, this is the good analogy is a Rube Goldberg machine where every single module depends on all of the other modules and one change in any one of these pieces is going to affect everything else. And when uh, these modules shouldn't be depending on each other like that, they should be calling public interfaces, not worrying about the details, getting a response and then working with it that way. 
uh, this this idea of having everything so intertwined and using each other's internal details for functionality. Uh, and of course, once you change one, oh, I already said that. But once you change one of these, when you're not even changing the interface all the methods are the same the public methods are the same but you change some internal private variable and all of a sudden you broke someone else's code like don't don't do this if you have examples of this if you ever see code that's so horrible that does this content coupling i'd like to see it post it to slack so we can all make fun of it um or maybe there is a good reason to have that but uh anyway that's the worst form of coupling content coupling horrible I can't believe it even exists. Uh, any developer using that should be fired. Uh, next, getting uh, still horrible, but a little more reasonable. You can debate. You can argue that you know there are reasons this is called for. I'll argue against you, but uh, uh, but common coupling. This is where different modules are sharing some global variables. This is where you have those big top-level public or public static variables, global variables, extern and C++. Uh, any global variable that's shared between modules, or even if it's not all the way global, but it's uh, at a, a higher level outside of each of the modules. You have two modules using the same variable as defined and maintained by another third module. Uh, that's common coupling, and it's no good. If, uh, if you don't know the problems, hopefully you've heard this a whole bunch of times, but never use global variables. If you don't know the problems, of using global variables, try using a global variable. I guarantee you will run into an issue eventually. Uh, the big problem is if one of these, I'm sure the slides are, I'm getting ahead of my slides. Uh, if one of these, if, no, I don't want to do that one. Uh, so if one of these uh, modules is called, it's used, its code is running, and it changes that global variable, well, that module just changed the behavior of all the other modules that use that global variable. And that's you know, the big reason why you're going to get in trouble with this. Once one module changes that global variable, well, all these other modules that are have been tested in isolation, they work perfectly on their own, but now once they're part of the bigger project, everything else all these other modules are changing that global variable and just everything breaks this is nearly impossible to test you have to do full integration testing that's really the only testing that that will matter with this because testing an individual module just isn't meaningful because you have no idea what the state of that global variable is going to be when you're running the full program and this is why they say public fields are evil uh, I will say this is a little debatable, but I will stay in, uh, I know where Dr. Hertz is coming from here. In Java, public fields are evil, for sure. If you're working in different languages, you can use public fields and get away with it, and everything can be great. In Java, just the way Java is structured, and at least in part the way the community uh, uh, rolls around Java, I'd say it is more fundamental to the language, though. Uh, public fields are evil. Once you have a public field, then uh, everybody can access and change that field, which is just asking for trouble. We have private fields and then getters and setters. It's a very Java thing because Java doesn't have uh, Java doesn't have a, a better way for for lack of a better term. And uh, I think a C plus plus thing. I don't think C plus plus has a better way to handle this. Uh, so it's make everything private and then use getters and setters. But this is a little bit, you know, somewhat controversial. Uh, like Python doesn't even have a private, a way to make things private. Um, but, uh, and there are arguments for that Java, JavaScript as well, or just does JavaScript. I think it has a, like a jank way of making things private. <laughs> it's stuck on ceiling fan. No, we didn't say stuck Jays. <laughs> I might've, but. And of course, the issue with public variables, public uh, fields, is that anybody can change them. That's our issue. So if we have this uh, this clock class that stores the time 
in hours and minutes. And then some other code that we're not going to include because it doesn't fit on the slide. Some simulator, which has an instance of a clock and can advance its minute. And then somewhere else in this, we have a simulator instance. Well, now somewhere else in this code base, two layers removed from the clock class can still access that clock's state variable. They're, it's fields. I'll stay can try to stay consistent with the slides. I call them state variables in 116, but to can modify those fields directly. So now the clock class can have these have its state just change its fields just change out of nowhere with no warning. So now to test this clock class, if you have a public variable, you have to be able to handle any possible value for those variables. So if it's, um, so if anybody can change these, what's stopping somebody from changing these to values that we don't expect? So sim, when we have this instance of a simulator, we can change those directly. We can also advance time by one minute, but who's responsible when we advance time by one minute? Who's responsible for when the minute is 59 and we add one? Who's responsible for updating the hour and setting minutes back to zero? Is it this code here that's supposed to do that? Should the simulator do that or should the clock do that? We have three choices and we just don't know. Uh, we just don't know who's supposed to be handling that when the fields are public. So if we want to just set the hours to 12, nothing's stopping us. Who's supposed to enforce that? That that shouldn't... Uh, um, when or sorry, when we have twelve fifty nine and we advance by a minute, who's supposed to handle that overflow? And what if we don't even know what standards we want to implement in this other code? What if we want to add some new standard? We want to store these jiffies since epoch, whatever that is. Uh, where uh, you know, if even if it's different than if a jiffy is different than uh, than milliseconds or nanoseconds since the epoch. Epic. Uh, what if we have some new standard that we don't even know about yet that we'll want to implement sometime in the future? So the clock class updates and we change this new standard, but look at all this code that we have that we could have all over our code base that accesses this hour and minute of the clock class, which don't even exist anymore. We updated that to use a different standard. Uh, now we have to go through all of our code anywhere the clock class is used and update that to this new standard. And that's just a headache. That is painful. Yeah, my, my top three favorite languages, I don't know, but uh, I might think about that after the lecture. If I, I, I could give a quick answer right now. Off the top of my head, probably Scala number one, just because I'm using it so much in 116 and everything I learn about that language I just I just like it I've been liking it uh, probably Python number two and three I don't even know if I have a, a third favorite maybe Java it might still be Java um, all right so encapsulation I mentioned this earlier and with how bad uh, content coupling is but encapsulation is this idea that we hide all of the details we hide information and then only expose a public interface and have our have other code only access our functionality through that public interface and this is how we get some better coupling some looser coupling and by not letting not letting and not forcing importantly but not even letting other modules access our internal details so here instead of just having hour and minute in the clock we're going to put the quanta advance method right in the clock class instead of having the simulator take a control of that you know i kind of like javascript i want to but Oh, the language. Like, every time I use it, it just gives me more pain. It's a tough one. I like it that it it lets you do whatever you want, but that's also its downside. Since there's no restrictions, it's very easy to have bad practices. 
just because it's like, well, JavaScript's going to let me do it. I, uh, so I'm going to do it. And C, yeah, C or JavaScript. I don't like C. I'll, I'll put that out there. C's fine, but I just don't like programming at that low level. I want to build stuff. I don't, I don't want to focus on all the little details and memory management. Uh, C is a perfectly fine language. It's just not for me. I'd, I'd rather be farther away from the wire. Uh, so now we put this method in the clock class, and now it's clear who's handling overflow. It's the clock class. Clock class is going to increment the minute. If minute 60, increment the hours. Uh, looking at this code, I'm not sure why minute is a float, and we're checking for equality with 60, but it's an example, so let's roll with it. Uh, let's, I'm going to assume that minute was supposed to be an int here. Uh, and, and then uh, getter method, get minute, so we can access the, the minutes. And then the simulator just uh, calls that quanta, quanta advance method. But wait, these are still public, so the simulator class can still just access the minutes directly, uh, get the minute, and then add one. Oops, we screwed up. So we want quanta advance to be controlled by the clock. We have our idea of encapsulation where we're hiding the details except we still made the details public so they're still accessible from outside the class. And now other developers on your team are gonna see these variables and be like, oh, well, I just wanna increment the minutes by one. I'm just gonna increment the minutes by one by accessing that minute uh, field directly. Oops, we still have something terrible. So, and now the standard changes, same issue. Uh, we change the standard, the minute variable doesn't exist. This code breaks. Now we have cascading failure throughout our code. We change the internal details of one. Um, maybe the, oh, you know what? This is an example of content um, content coupling because it does depend on the inner details. I see. Um, uh, I was thinking inner functionality, inner methods, but the inner variables. I see. Um, so uh, so now we change to this Jiffy standard. This breaks, minute doesn't exist, broken code, cascading failure. We changed code in one module, we broke another module. And when it was just internal details, it wasn't even part of our API, which is quanta advance and git minute. It's, uh, yeah, it is an example of delegation as well. So this is our problem here. This is an error, no good. So what we did any did any code even change there? Oh, we just got rid of. No, we went back to that. Anyway, we want to make these private. These are internal details. We don't want anybody to change these because they're going to change them in ways that are going to break our code. Make them private and control the changes to these through getters and setters. In this case, we don't want anyone setting these. Uh, we only want them to be able to advance in time by one minute. And we'll tell them what the current minute is. And we should probably tell them what the hour is too. But, you know, the slide is only so big. We don't want to put all the code for this implementation on there. We'll just get the juicy bits in there. So now let's get rid of this horribleness and just call. Just defer or delegate as uh, synchronous, synchronous is, is saying. The quanta advance method can just defer to the clock. Okay, clock, quanta advance, whatever you do when that method is called, do your thing. And now it's clear that the clock is responsible for those minute overflows. When the minute hits 60, it's clock's responsibility. We have no question anymore. It's not the simulator. The simulator is going to defer. And the code that uses simulator, likewise, is going to defer. Hopefully. Uh, and now the standard changes. We switch from hours and minutes to jiffies. Our get minute method updates to some calculation based on the number of jiffies and jiffies per minute and everything. Does some math and returns what the actual minute is. So now our clock is using a completely different standard. But our simulator does not care. Our simulator code did not change. And that's what we're getting from a looser coupling. Since these two modules are loosely coupled now, where they were strongly coupled, now that they're loosely coupled, changes in one don't affect the other one. Simulator is just calling the methods, and then the clock, as all the in 
uh, details encapsulated inside of it in private fields. So nobody can modify them except through calling Quanta Advance and Git Minute. Say Jiffy's five times fast. Oh boy. Jiffy's, 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 Jiffy's. Not too bad. Uh, so any questions on this one? C is kind of beautiful in its simplicity. I do like C. I just don't like using it, I guess. I, I understand it. Kind of like I understand assembly, why it exists, and I, I think it's fantastic. I just don't want to use it. Hell, even machine code. Machine code is fantastic. The API of the processor itself, it's really interesting stuff. I just don't want to code at that level. It's not what I want to be doing. Yeah, C really expects you to know what you're doing. And seg faults. That's C is pretty much synonymous with seg faults. That's the error you get. But uh, if you you get good at C, you can do some really cool things with it. But most of it's uh, most of it pertains to optimization. If you have a problem that you need to optimize the crap out of. You should be pulling out C. That's why any, like uh, like databases and things like that, any uh, operating systems, they're all going to be written in C when performance is critical. So let's talk about the next level of coupling, control coupling. This is where we get the delegation. We did, uh, did kind of see an example of it in the clock. So no data is shared. Actually, this is a little bit different than that. Um, so no data is shared here uh, between two modules, but one module is going to ask the other module to perform some computation, and it's going to send some flags or magic values to be able to determine what is going to be called. Um, I, uh, I believe that was my example from Friday of the math class. It would be like having one big math method and then always sending it a string saying... Uh, uh, sign okay compute the sign between these inputs or give it the string add as a param as an argument uh, and then add these values and just having one method and delegating to that but telling it what it's supposed to do through some magical um, magical parameter so this is looser coupling than what we've talked about so far but it's uh, uh, it has its issues of course so when uh, when you have this, you have to define what these magical flags and values are going to be, what they're expected to be. Uh, and actually, there's some of this in the Java library itself, now I think about it. To get like a hash function, you have to give it a string specifying which hash function you want. And the problem with that is you have to look at the documentation to be able to tell which hash functions exist. Because you pass the hash function as a string. So you just have to guess, like which, or not guess, but look up the documentation or guess, I guess. I've done that before. Uh, I want this hash function. This is what I would have called it, and then I hope it works. <laughs> Definitely done that. But uh, uh, but you really should look up what, you know, what are all these magic values. Uh, I kind of think of uh, regular expressions as this, too. You always have to look up the documentation to see all the syntax that you need for the strings that you give your regular expression to be able to get the regex to do what you want it to do. You always got to look it up. Okay, what were all the symbols? What was a star? What was a plus? Um, that's kind of kind of the same idea here. So you're delegating to another module, but you really have to specify how that module should work and kind of specifying some of the internals of that module. When really you just want to call a method, it'd be better to just call a method. Math.sign that's what I want because uh, the documentation writes itself then you just look at all the public methods your ID can even give you a whole list of them as soon as you type that dot it's a lot easier math function hell yeah build an operating system in JavaScript uh, so this can be really I see this as a good example I'm not sure what exactly dr. Hertz was thinking if he did this as a good or a bad example I see this as a good example where you have a private method 
to handle your recursion and also a public method that calls the private method. So the private method is being controlled by the public method, but I would argue that this is more internal details to the module itself. That yes, this is a kind of a tight coupling and, of, and it is control coupling between the public and private methods. Uh, but the public method is the only one exposed to the outside world, outside of this module. And you defer to that private method. But you do have to have some setup. Like if somebody else wrote this private method and your task is to write the public method, you really got to talk to the, that developer and say, how, what, what, what is this doing? Because it's probably not going to be immediately obvious to the person who didn't write it. As long as the same people are writing both of these. Uh, if this is across developers, yeah, that that can be a problem because you really have to know how to recall the private one. And this is usually where the public method is the API, and then the private one has some is calls the private method, private recursive method, with some initial value like an empty list or zero if it's accumulating integers, something like that. Uh, hopefully, you've all written code like that before. I don't have to go into more details. But I'd be happy to after lecture. Uh, so next one, stamp coupling. Here's where, uh, there's only one more after this. So we're getting into coupling. That's pretty good. This is where, where we're starting to get into the really good ones. Even control coupling is pretty good, uh, but can be problematic with these magic values. Those are tough to, uh, uh, tough to handle. And the encapsulation, this was certainly a good example. This is some really good, uh, coupling. I don't know which category specifically that would fall into, though. That's just a, a really good uh, core uh, programming concept. So stamp coupling is similar to common coupling, which was the second one we talked about, which is horrible. That's using global variables. Uh, but this one, stamp coupling, like that, shares global data, or at least shares data, but shares values, not variables. So values meaning that they cannot change. So this would be like having a static constants in, I guess, in Java, but having global constants instead of global variables. This is much better and not necessarily even global, but they might be passing the data amongst themselves, but values, not variables. These values can be fairly large, they can, um, they can uh, be entire classes, which is where this is going to get into not quite perfect coupling and uh, become problematic. But we will use getters to get that encapsulation of, uh, to get that data, that data can't, um, the data that we get can't change. But one issue with this is that you can control the fields of that data I don't know if I'm saying that quite exactly right, but let's just get to the let's just get to the example. So we have a full name class with two private variables with their own getters and setters. We have a student class that uh, that has a full name instance with its uh, you know with those state variables fields uh, and a get name method which returns the name directly. Uh, and then some other code that is coupled with the student code using stamp coupling. The student, it can give this entire piece of data, this full name object, over to some other code through this getter method. That's what makes this stamp coupling. And then when we get an instance of that, when we get the instance of that name, this is going to be passed by reference so when we say student.getName, that's returning a reference to the full name object that stores this first name, last name. Since we have a reference to that object and that uh, we can't change that reference directly, so that's where it's a value, not a variable, we can't just go into the student and change its full name reference, but we can call a method that's going to change one of the fields in that reference on the heap. So now when we say fname.setLastName, we use one of the setters of the full name class, it's going to change that last name. And since it's a reference to the same name of the student, that student's name has then changed. 
even though we didn't violate anything, we just called getters and setters. Full name is encapsulating the first name and last name like it should. Student is keeping it, the full name private, doing everything there, and then just using a getter. But since this getter is by reference, and there is a method that has a side effect, we can actually change the name of the student without the student knowing about it. So shouldn't the student be able to control their own name? The student should have full control over this name. It shouldn't allow other modules, even though there's nothing blatant about this, it still does allow other modules to change the name of the student, which is something we would rather avoid. We don't want people doing this. Uh, that, again, makes things harder to test. It makes bugs harder to find. You're trying to debug the student class. So you see that it's, the student's name just changed out from under them, and you're trying to figure out how, why, and where. It's tougher to debug than if you don't allow this kind of coupling. But again, this is much better. This is more common to have objects with data encapsulated in them and then pass them around your code. Uh, this isn't, you know, this is the second to last one that we're talking about. It's the second best in in uh, in this. If this is the only way that you have tighter coupling and everything else is loosely coupled, you know, you're doing okay. Uh, and then you got to be careful of changing things when you're passing things by reference because that could be a pretty tricky bug to find. Uh, in delegation, just quickly, this is where uh, where classes are delegating to other classes uh, by calling their methods. So you have one class and you have or one module and another module with some public methods, and you call those public methods from one class to another. As long as those methods don't have side effects, this is uh, this is a great way to uh, to have things loosely coupled and easier to test. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll talk about the math class again. When you write, when the Java or Java, I mean any language, when any language is writing their standard libraries math methods, they don't have to worry about any other code. They they're not building in any changing state in the math class. You can't change any variables there. They just write these mathematical functions, they test them once, and then millions of developers use those methods over the course of their lifetime. Uh, the code is shared, it's reused over and over and over again because they're very loosely coupled, and then other code just delegates, uh, delegates to those methods. So they have someone else do it. So now instead of this getter method, we're going to write more methods. It'll be a little more code. But if we rename this, if the student has a set last name method, so instead of just giving up its um, its uh, data directly, so instead of having this code say, hey, student, what's your full name? Return a reference and then have this code work with that. Now instead, this code is going to say, hey, student, I'm going to defer to you. Can you set your last name to this? And then the student can control that. And now at least in the student class, we can see that name change occurring. And we can have any checks that we want or any updates to records that we want here. We can control that name change when we have delegation like this. So we're just going to say set last name and then defer to name, the full name class, set last name, and do what it needs to do there. So now we can't have the student's name changing out from under them anymore. We will have to write more methods to do this delegation, to have this class tell this class to tell this class to change its data. But it's going to avoid a lot of those really spaghetti code bugs where some data is changing in some module that's completely unrelated to where the data actually lives. Again, two layers removed from where the data actually lives, the data is being changed. That's uh, That can be tricky to debug. And, oh, we're two minutes over already. Uh, well, I want to get to the, the best, uh, the last one. Data coupling, this is where only, uh, where only values are shared, but all the data is a Tom, not necessarily atomic, but uh, we're not passing references that can uh, have its their fields changed. 
So we're just going to pass strictly data. Think like uh, like calling ints anything that's passed by value, as long as that value is not a reference. Or if a reference is passed and that reference doesn't have any uh, any changing state, no uh, no field variables, possibly values though, and no methods with side effects. Getting rid of all of that, making sure that nothing can change. And uh, and there, then we have perfect coupling. We have completely loose coupling. This is more of a functional programming approach where functional programming, you're only passing data. That data is almost always immutable or possibly always. If you're purely functional programming, the data should always be immutable and no side effects, just pure functions throughout your entire code. You have the loosest coupling possible all of your modules are completely independent and they just have input output behavior and no side effects easy to test you always know the state of the program because there really is no state you just have input and output behavior of each method or each function in this case if you're purely functional um, easy to test easy to reuse code and you don't have to worry about any state changing uh, in summary, loose coupling is better than tight coupling. This is easier to reuse your code, easier to debug, easier to do pretty much anything. A little tougher to set up. You have to have more design practice, more design up front, but it's well, well worth it. If you're used to writing these tightly coupled programs, uh, I strongly recommend write your design your code to be loosely coupled for this project. Because when you, if you're tightly coupled, you get late in the semester and you're trying to add those Sprint 3 tasks, so those Sprint 3 features, or Sprint 4 features, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard to make changes if you're tightly coupled. And cohesion's still a thing. Uh, single responsibility is also a thing. I briefly mentioned this last time, but each module should have just one responsibility. Write that module to do one thing and then stop if you are tempted to make it do a second thing don't do it start a new module and have that new module do the second thing and a reminder that sprint one is also happening